when I first heard about it, I tried on my own. Mm-hmm. I have asthma, so I can't hold my breath for very long. When I actually went and got tested, um, they're like blow out, there's a computer program where you blow out candles on a computer and through a device. It's basically like a, a breathalyzer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have the lung capacity, this is kind of crazy, but I have the lung capacity of like a 65 year old mm. as a 40 as a 40 year old. So when I first did Wim Hof, the first thing you kind of do is like, hold your breath for as long as you can. So I tried it and I'm in the gym. It's I'm, I'm sitting by myself and I have my watch on and I, um, I take a breath, I, I, I hold it. I hit the stopwatch and I'm like, okay, close my eyes and I hold my breath for as long as I can. And when it gets really hard, I'm like, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. When it gets excruciating to the point where like, I feel like my head is gonna um, explode. I'm like, hold on for five to 10 more seconds. Hold on for five to 10 more seconds. You're not gonna pass out. Hold on five to 10 more seconds. And when I finally can't hold anymore, I click stop. I look down at my watch and it was, <laughs> <laughs> It was 17 seconds. (laughs) We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stop. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. How are you, Mr. Ben Bergeron? I am good, Mr. Patrick. How are you doing? (laughs) I'm doing really well. Today we are returning to um, my Instagram DMs, my long list of great questions that we get from listeners. Um, And I've got a collection. I think we've got maybe 10 or 11 today. And the challenge for you is to answer them within two minutes. Sometimes uh, that is easy and sometimes that is comically fun for me to watch. Um, nice. And um, so thank you to everybody who, who does send us messages. We've got a long, uh, long list that I'm still pulling from. But if you've got any, find me on Instagram at PS Cummings and just drop me a DM and I uh, promise I will read them and add them to our list. Um, and as always, the uh, subject matters here uh, are varied, but certainly within the scope of things that we talk about all the time. Ready? Right. Ready. Let's go. Rock and roll. First question. First question. I'm trying to adapt a more positive mindset in all aspects of life, but how can I be the person in the class, uh, CrossFit class, who is positive about a workout and not joining in uh, with groans of everyone else when they see a certain exercise on the board? I'm one of the fitter people in class, and I don't want to come across as overconfident or arrogant. I think the groaning is most mostly playful conversation, but I want to be more positive without excluding myself from the group. Wow, that's um, love that question. Love the self awareness. Love the awareness of uh, the power of words, and love mm. the awareness that most people are doing it kind of haphazardly and just kind of doing and poking fun. Um, love the idea that he's trying to work on his uh, mental game. There's a lot to uh, to like about that question. Um, to get to the specifics of it, um, while keeping this under two minutes, and I'm eating up precious <laughs> time right now. Uh, the first thing, um, I would do is, is what we just mentioned is, uh, congratulate the awareness aspect. Like that's the first thing. So if, if you are trying to work on it, which is kind of what the, the, the ethos of this question is like, dude, you're doing it like so well doing it. Um, phenomenal job. The next part is, um, how do you, um, kind of call out the other people without, um, excluding yourself? Mm. It's hard, Um, but essentially that's where you um, are taking the stand of becoming a leader. And a leader might not be liked by everybody, but they're respected by everybody. And when you start to call things out like that, people are not gonna like it because it Mm. is playful, fun banter, and you are excluding yourself saying, I'm not one of you, I'm not like you, I don't, I have higher standards and expectations than what is being presented right now in this group. Now, that will be respected in the long run. It might not be liked in the moment. Leadership can be a lonely spot. Mm. So I'm not saying it's something that you want to necessarily do. If you are just a member of the group and this is a big social outlet place for you, you might be exactly where you want to be, which is I am operating on my own level of standards. I recognize other people not be meeting me where I am, and I might be okay with that. 
you don't constantly have to be the one fixing things, particularly um, um, if you do think it's just um, social light banter. Now, yeah. in my world where I am and I am the leader in my organization, when I hear that, I call it out because um, it's not about me being one of the guys. It's about me setting up the culture in the environment for a place that creates the best possible results for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay. Second question. I recently left my job as a classroom teacher to set up my own business as a private tutor. I know full well that businesses take time to build, but I'm finding... <laughs> oh my God, is that your... <laughs> I love that. Yes. How is it taking this many this many yeah. episodes for that to happen? Because... You have two uh, young children in the because house. Because I asked very nicely for him not to do that, but occasionally it... And that it, works. It, yes, it does. That's so incredible. Far. He does sometimes go crazy. Okay, next next question. I, I recently left it. my job as a classroom teacher to set up my own business as a private tutor. I know full well that businesses take time to build, but I'm finding it difficult to hold my nerve. Some days when I don't hit uh, the targets I need, I feel like I should just go back to the classroom. How do I get over or work through this worry? Cool. Okay, so this is like anybody trying to achieve anything. Yeah. So we could substitute yourself for I'm trying to lose weight and I'm not doing hitting my numbers. Yeah. I'm trying to make it to the CrossFit Games and I'm not hitting my strength numbers. I'm trying to write a book and I'm not hitting the number of pages. It's like this is this is the the story of um, a trying to achieve anything. Yeah. Yep. The the first thing I would do is um, revisit your targets. Hmm. Usually targets are arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Like what, like why did, if you're discouraged because you're not hitting your quote unquote targets, how did you actually come up with those targets? And if you lowered your targets, would you then not be discouraged? Isn't that kind of weird? Mm -hmm. Like what we're trying to do here is continually create progress. We're not trying to win today. You're trying to keep moving forward, keep taking baby step after baby step after baby step. That aggregation of the marginal gains is what creates the big discrepancies between those that achieve a lot and those that achieve some and those that don't achieve anything. Mm -hmm. I get the frustration. It's super frustrating to not hit your numbers. But as um, Thomas Edison has said, or maybe it was, uh, maybe it was Einstein, it's like, it's not, I'm not necessarily that much smarter than anyone else. I just stick with problems longer. Mm. So you need to do what you need to do to figure out how to stick through this. My first piece of advice would get rid of the arbitrary, arbitrary, and they are benchmarks. Mm-hmm because they don't mean a whole lot. If mm -hmm. Katrin's trying to get stronger and she's not hitting her back squat progressions, does that mean we should back away and not work on our back squat progressions? They're arbitrary numbers that you're throwing out into the universe and they, they actually come from most of the cases, don't come from anywhere. Maybe they come from, you have to hit so much to um, pay your rent. Maybe they have to do so much to um, pay employees. Maybe they have to do so much to create the growth targets to satisfy investors. Maybe they mm -hmm. have to do with, um, whatever they are, they're still arbitrary. Like you have to figure out what um, what it is that you actually should be focusing on. And to me, this is the whole thing behind commit to the process. Mm. It's not about the results you're achieving. It is about the commitment to the process. In fact, the way I say this is, it's not even about the commitment to the process. It's about the person you're becoming while staying while trying to stay committed to the process. So the win here is actually, and the story you're telling yourself actually becomes, I have a lot of fortitude, I have a lot of discipline, I have a lot of grit, I'm the type of person that will work through this to the end. I am dot, dot, dot. Now, the one caveat we have to do place on this, the big asterisk is, there has to be an appropriate place to know when to pivot. Mm. If you are just so bullheaded, you see things through to the death, that is not the right, opportunity for this whatsoever. Right. If you are so dedicated to your mission that you actually can't see the other opportunities that is an opportunity for you to pivot, you end up with like a lot of these Fortune 500 companies that were part of the Dow Industrial Average in the 80s that don't even exist anymore. Yeah. Do you have you found in your own life that it's hard to differentiate or distinguish between when you're being stubborn and when you're being persistent? <laughs> Cuz I find that I I sometimes have to ask myself like, okay, which of these am I actually being in this case? And do you have any sense of um, like when you feel like you're one versus the other? Um, yeah, it's, it, um, 
So one of the things I've, I've started to, through some self-reflection, is become um, okay with two ends of the same spectrum. Mm. We don't need to live with this binary yep. world, yep. right? Which is like, I am, I am so steadfast. I am so committed. I am so disciplined. Whereas the other opportunity side of that is like, I am creative. I am nimble. I am quick to decide. I can pivot. I am flexible. Like you can be both things. It's not one or the other. And one's not better than the other. Mm. Uh, it's very much like um, I am trying to kick ass with my business and be a kick ass dad. Yep. You don't need to be just one or the other. And when you take away the polarity of these extremes and you go, just that um, story we're telling ourselves, that paradigm shift of it's not, I just need to be one, I can be the other. It's kind of like um, working out. Mm -hmm. I work out really, really, really hard. I think it's ridiculous when I hear people say, I have never quit a workout. Like, what are you talking about? You've never quit a workout. So either you've never done a really hard workout that like your body started to break down in, or you're so stubborn that you don't listen to your body when it's breaking <laughs> down and stop. Yeah. Like I change workouts every single week in the middle of them. <laughs> like I'm, and I'm, 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 it's not that I'm like aloof. It's not that yeah. I don't care. It's not that I'm not disciplined. I am very regimented and very disciplined and very committed, but I'm also going to listen to my body and be flexible and kind of adapt to the, the stimuluses that are being presented to me in real time. And I think it's just a matter of understanding those aspects. Mm. You don't need to be the most committed person in the world because if you are that, you're going to miss some other opportunities. Similar to that is you don't want to be the person that pivots at every turn. Right. You know, my 14, you know, my 16 year old son um, <laughs> and yep. not commit to anything. Yep. You, you can be both things. Yeah. I um, love that. Second follow-up uh, and then we'll move on. Um, you talked about not, um, or at least, um, looking really closely at those those arbitrary targets, those arbitrary, usually numbers, right? Um, and then you talked about kind of instead focusing on both the person you're becoming and the process that you're on. Would you then, would you try or do you try to replace those kind of arbitrary outside of your control metrics mm -hmm. with some kind of like internal or controllable metrics so that at least yeah. you know, okay, I am on track and I'm on track to things that I feel like are going to put me on the right, you know, in the right on the right path? Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a great question, Patrick. Um, so in, um, for me with my athletes and coaching, I can do that, particularly if they're in, 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 in front of me. Mm -hmm. And we substitute out the score, the result, for the process, the commitment, for the character, which is how hard are you, uh, are you working? Yep. So when I see somebody, I can, so I can actually, when I'm watching them, that's what matters the most is how hard, how much effort and preparation are you putting towards this? Uh, it's such a great question because I, I'm trying to do that in the business world and it's really freaking hard. Mm. It's really hard to create levels of um, gauge, levels of commitment and effort in the business sense. Yep. Because some people can get a lot of work done in a little amount of time and other people take a long time to create uh, the same amount of work. Yep. So you can't do it by, by hours. Yep. So it's an unfair metric. So you literally have to go by, what you then have to do is you have to kind of like, it's hard to go off of the, um, the character and effort and you have to swing towards the process. Mm. And that's where we kind of lay into um, a little bit more. So that's why people like, uh, you know, great writers and um, Seth Godin and people, they're like, it's about the, pro it's like write one paragraph, one sentence a day. Mm -hmm. Jerry Seinfeld, write one crappy joke a day. It's like, it's all about the process. Mm -hmm. And in career world, in the business world, to me, that's the one that seems to make the most sense. As opposed to, so let's take Jerry Seinfeld. Jerry Seinfeld's uh, recommendation to new and upcoming comedians is to write one crappy, crappy joke every single day. Mm -hmm. If you do that long enough, you come up with a, a, a whole repertoire, a whole resume of, of great um, content. What you don't want to do is focus on the end state, which is like, I'm going to get on the tonight show, which yep. is I'm going to get um, 50,000 likes on this video it, that I'm going to get um, nine odd um, auditions with a network. Tell It's like, 
you can't focus on those result type things. You got to focus just on the process, which is completely inside your control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've got two questions that were close enough to in relations. I'm going to kind of batch them. Um, cool. The first one is, have you ever tried the Wim Hof breathing method? And then the second one is, so what yes. are the, <laughs> and then the second one is, what are the easy. benefits of nasal breathing and do you use it with your athletes? Okay. So obviously those aren't the uh, same thing, but they're both yeah. bo close, close enough yep. that I wanted to batch them. Okay, so um, Wim Hof breathing is um, a method of <laughs> breathing um, <laughs> popularized by um, this guy, Wim Hof, um, mm -hmm. who's like, in, is incredible um, freak, of Nate, freak of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, so he basically, the, the, it's basically to, to say what it is and then, what it, then the why. Um, what it is, it's a very... Um, deep diaphragmatic breath, very aggressive where you're oxygenating. It's, um, it is, I'm going to, I mean, I'll do it very quickly, but <sighs> where you're breathing in through your belly and your diaphragm through mm -hmm. your lungs and then up through your head. You're bringing, well, it's happening to me right now. <laughs> Just literally those um, five to 10 breaths yeah. brings, they oxygenate your body. They bring so much oxygen in, you're getting a little bit of carbon dioxide out and then more oxygen, a little CO2 out and more oxygen in. Through that process of um, supra oxygenation, you, this is Wim Hof's claim, you can actually gain access to the autonomic nervous system, mm -hmm. which is essentially like the things that we didn't think you control, your body temperature, your immune system, um, your um, adrenaline, your lots of your um, lots of things that we didn't think that just we thought like happened automatically, your yep. heart rate and other stuff. Um, through that, you gain a lot of power. Um, you mm. can heal yourself. You can regulate your body temperature. Um, so he's been able to be injected with viruses in laboratories and under medical supervision. And through um, microscopes, they've seen him's um, body go and attack these viruses. He's been put in ice tanks and he can actually control um, his own body temperature to certain, actually even to certain limbs. The, the doctors say, can you heat up your left hand? And he brings attention to his left hand. He can, so you're like, oh my God. So Cool. He's a freak. He's a he's a mutant. He's not human. Mm -hmm. um, the cool part is, um, this is very. It's a very learnable skill that other people have been able to uh, replicate. Um, so I've done it with. Um, I first read about it and tried on my own, with very minimal success. Um, and then I um, did it with a Wim Hof coach. I've done it uh, a handful mm. of times with a Wim Hof coach, um, and. Um, it's, in, it's crazy so much. So it's like, um, you have these, like, uh, it, it, the, the saying is you get high on your mm -hmm. own supply. Mm -hmm. You actually have these, like, you can, some people can have these like little hallucinogenic, um, yep. experiences. Um, I, I certainly had a little bit of like an out of body experience. Um, your, your hands and feet can, um, incredibly, um, they get incredibly tingly and you kind of, um, it's, um, for all of the meditation and, um, yoga practicing that I've ever done, it's basically meditation on steroids. Mm. It puts you into the deepest. So the, the, another example to this, um, you definitely butchering the two minutes, but this was okay. two questions in one. Yep. I'm kind of, yep. um, the, the coach that I worked with has done things like um, ten day retreats, you know, where you don't talk to anybody. Ten day meditation retreats where you, there's silence, um, and you know, in his words, in a ten minutes of Wim Hof breathing, um, you get in a much deeper metabol uh, meditative state than you do in ten days mm. of solitude meditation. Mm. It's um, it's pretty incredible. Um, I definitely recommend it uh, for everyone to try it and experience it. Um, I have done it with my athletes. Um, there's cool physical tests you can do that because you're so oxygenated, you can hold your breath for a longer, lot longer. You can actually perform better. It's fleeting though. It's not kind of holding onto it for a long time. It can give you better, uh, respiratory, um, control. Um, but it's, uh, it's definitely a, um, worthwhile experience for sure. And here's the, here's the first example. So, um, 
when I first heard about it, I tried on my own. Mm-hmm. I have asthma, so I can't hold my breath for very long. When I actually went and got tested, um, they're like blow out. There's a computer program where you blow out candles on a computer and through a device. It's basically like a, a breathalyzer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have the lung capacity. This is kind of crazy, but I have the lung capacity of like a 65 year old mm. as a 40 as a 40 year old. Mm. Um, um, so when I first did Wim Hof, the first thing you kind of do is like hold your breath for as long as you can. So I tried it and I'm in the gym. It's I'm, I'm sitting by myself and I have my watch on and I, um, I take a breath, I, I, I hold it, I hit the stopwatch and I'm like, okay, close my eyes and I hold my breath for as long as I can. And when it gets really hard, I'm like, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. When it gets excruciating to the point where like, I feel like my head is gonna um, explode. I'm like, hold on for five to 10 more seconds. Hold on for five to 10 more seconds. You're not gonna pass out. Hold on five to 10 more seconds. And when I finally can't hold anymore, I click stop. I look down at my watch and it was, <laughs> it was 17 seconds. <laughs> so I was like, very humbling, very, very humbling. <laughs> so I, um, so I then go through one practice. I do a couple yep. cycles of Wim Hof breathing. You basically do that. <sighs> and you do that for about 30 times. Um, hold your breath for a little bit, do it again, hold your breath for a little bit. Um, at the end of it, I do it again and I hold my breath and I make it, um, for 48 seconds. Mm -hmm. I was like, Whoa, that's a big difference. I didn't do it. That was like years and years ago when I first came across Wim Hof. When I started working with this guy, I hadn't done it for years. And at the very first go, I was holding my breath for over two and a half minutes. Mm. So holding your breath for two and a half minutes is no joke. That's like legit. And this is somebody that couldn't hold their breath for 20 seconds. So just kind of like that, like at peace, you find this really at peace feeling. It's so strange, but um, that's a really long answer. I can't believe I talked that long about Wim Hof breathing in a two minute drill. I didn't, um, I did not then, anticipate that answer either. I didn't yeah, realize you had been, right. um, you, you were experimenting with it. Um, and then the next piece, that, and, we, and by the way, then you do cold pl- plunges. Mm, and the idea yep. behind a cold plunge and it's freezing cold. So water freezes at 32 degrees. We cold plunged in uh, 37 degrees. Mm. Um, it's so, but it's basically like you learn to, when you get in there, you go shock, fight or flight. Your body, you yep. go, <laughs> your body starts to jackhammer and you, <laughs> these really shallow breaths. And through this, you just like, you work on the exhale. It's like, <sighs> And you can control mm. this fight or flight mechanism. And mm. the idea is if you can control it in that stressful environment, well, now when your boss says, hey, can you work on Saturday? Yep. You don't freak out. You can kind of control it in other, when the guy flicks you off in traffic, yep. you can then control it. And you take control of your kind of like, um, your, your paras- the flip between parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, mm-hmm. um, which is rest and digest and fight or flight. Mm-hmm. Um, so next one is have nasal breathing. Yep. Um, and have I done with my athletes? I've been exposed to it, um, I, but I have not done it to the level I've done Wim Hof. And I have not done it with my athletes. I know Got it's it. big in the space right now. And yeah. um, Laird Hamilton and Brian McKenzie and a lot of these guys are getting yep. really into it. Um, yep. I've, I've done a little bit of research into it, but not enough to kind of talk educatedly about it. Got it. Cool. Um, okay, next one. What's your take on the implementation of high-skilled gymnastics in a group class? CrossFit.com has things like L pull-ups and strict kipping muscle-ups and others. Where does that fall into the group class model focused on GPP? Yeah, um, love that question. Um, I don't think it falls into it. This is my own opinion, but I don't think it falls into it. Most of our members are not coming to us to look for um, elite levels of fitness. So think competitive CrossFit athlete, um, collegiate level athlete in another sport, um, Olympic level athlete or junior Olympics, or the third wave adaptations that is necessitated in the sport of CrossFit or gymnastics. So to me, those, and by the way, those are not high level skilled gymnastics in terms Mm -hmm. of gymnastics, they're high level for CrossFitters. Mm -hmm. Um, Even said that, I think you're much better off. Most members are gonna be coming to you two and a half times a week. Mm -hmm. That's the average. Now, I know that sounds weird. When we track this, I mean, we have very dedicated members. The average, it just, we, we see a lot of our members 
four and five and six times a week. So it feels yep. like everyone comes out of yep. the normal person is coming about 2.78% times, times yeah. a week. Yep. So if you're going to use up one of those hours based on how to teach somebody a kipping handstand push up, I think you're doing them a disservice. Yeah, I think you'd be doing a much better job teaching them the proper mechanics of how to pick something off the ground, aka deadlift, how to get up off the toilet, aka squat, or how to put something above their head, aka press, and then working them through something that's going to cause some sort of um, physiological response from a um, strength slash um, um, cardiovascular um, stimulus, aka teach them how to move and have them work out. Yeah. <laughs> Next one. I've heard you guys talk about how Monster and Red Bull are bad. I've noticed a lot of CrossFitters drinking Bang energy drinks, claiming they're better because of uh, the creatine and aminos. What's your take? Okay. Um, so I do think <laughs> – this is so funny. Okay. Um, I haven't done a Monster or Red Bull or any of those things um, in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Dot, dot, dot. Um, this summer, I probably had uh, seven monsters uh, <laughs> throughout the summer yep. for whatever mm -hmm. weird reason. Um, so, I mean, that's across a couple months. I had seven yep. of those, maybe like once at one every two weeks. And strangely enough, I had one today. So, um, <laughs> and strangely enough, this is going to sound like I'm an energy drink addict, but really I've had, you know, probably um, eight of these in the last uh, two and a half, three months, maybe. Yep. Um um, I had my first bang this past mm, weekend. That's funny. I'm um, not so actually what bang one. is, yeah, bang, it's, it's a caf, it's an energy drink. Yep. Um, and it has creatine, it has amino acids in it. So you could say it's better than that. I think the reason it's better though, is because to me, it doesn't have quite as many of the, um, we'll call them, um, chemical artificial additives yep. that a monster or a, um, Red Bull or something like that might have. Um, but I'm not here to promote energy drinks. I think they are bad for you. Um, I feel guilty that I had one today, but it's just so funny that we're talking about this. So I feel like the universe is conspiring yeah. against me. Yep. Um, it's like a, you had, um, and, uh, um, I think that you're much better off having clean sources of, of caffeine, yep. coffee, tea, even like, um, like a, a scent, the protein company makes a very clean, uh, pre-workout or even like a ca if caffeine pill, cause it has mm. nothing else in it. Yep. Got it. Next question. I'm 48 and in decent shape. I love CrossFit, but have just found out that I have a grade four arthritis in one knee. Deep squats, lunges, box jumps, and anything that I have to get to 90 degrees causes pain, inflammation, and swelling. I'm curious how older athletes or ones with limiting injuries should approach training so that we get to be quote unquote one of the guys, but not have to sit in a tub of ice every night. Yeah, I love that. So that's there's somebody that definitely gets the social aspect of what yep. we're doing. Yep. Um, mm. You know, it's and it's huge that we cannot discount that. There's a reason that um, our fitness um, is done the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, so I I I love that. Um, meaning it's done in groups. Um, the you can still do all of the movements you just listed. Um, so my wife Heather um, had. Um, a meniscus issue earlier this, and she couldn't go below parallel and she couldn't do all the things that you're just listing. Yep. Um, so when we did lunges, she kept that leg um, above 90 degrees. And when it was the trailing leg, she kept it straight. Mm. Now she's lucky enough that she has good flexibility, um, which is what I would encourage you to do is to spend extra time on mobility, extra um, ankle and hip mobility, Adductor, so all about the um, that kind of hip area. It will help. Usually, issues are caused either from upstream or downstream, not at the site of the symptoms. Um, now, I get it. Your arthritis is it is there. I know you can see it on an X-ray or MRI, um, but working up and downstream will definitely help it. Um, the thing I would not do is um, try to work through it. Mm. You don't, that's not going to help with this. What you want to do is get it as close to the range of motion as you can, um, but not go through it. And then try to work through it a little bit with, uh, in a controlled environment with a lacrosse ball, with some voodoo floss, with um, a supernova. Check out Kelly Starrett's stuff. It's awesome. And what I would not do is then get an ice tub. You will not heal it getting an ice tub. That actually slows down the healing process. 
which is a whole nother discussion. I think we've talked about that plenty of yes, times. Yes, we have. Yep. 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 Okay. Should there be any difference in trainings, whether that's or in training, whether that's CrossFit or cycling or whatnot, when somebody's in a caloric deficit as opposed to when they're in a, a maintenance or caloric surplus? Yes. So let's uh, let's let's kind of give some context to what that means. Um, a caloric deficit means you're eating less calories than you are expending. Yep. So if you're burning 2,000 calories and you're only taking in 1,200, that's a caloric deficit. Um, that is a surefire way to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to. That's just, it's just uh, thermo. It's just like it's. It's the way it works, and the opposite is true if you were trying to gain weight. Mm -hmm. um, now it's not it's not totally lettered to the law. You could have more calories and um, lose weight depending on the quality of the calories and how you're training. So, but in general, that's what is meant by this question. Um, and the answer is yes. You should be low. You cannot put in the same training volume and intensity um, that you would otherwise in a caloric. Um, homeostasis or um, surplus. Mm -hmm. So you do need to pay attention to those things. It's the reason why as our athletes ramp up their volume from being a regular gym goer to a semi-competitive athlete to a world-class athlete, the volume goes up, so does their caloric needs. It's why Michael Phelps was consuming you know, between six and 10,000 calories a day because mm -hmm. he's spending four to five hours in a pool. It's why Cole Sager has 550 grams of carbohydrates a day, which mm -hmm. is over um, 2,000 calories just of carbs. So you add in the proteins and the fats, and the dude's eating, you know, five, six thousand calories. It's like you, as you train at that volume and that intensity, you need to fuel the engine. If you don't, you will break down. Got it. What qualities or characteristics makes somebody coachable, and how do you successfully develop coachable athletes? Two things: um, humility and a growth mindset. Mm. So you have to you have to realize that you don't have all the answers. So to be a coachable athlete, and this is by the way, whether it's a coachable athlete or a coachable in business, or you have to see feedback as the shortcut to betterment, mm -hmm. not as criticism. Big big key point there. When you um, if you if you see feedback as criticism, you have an ego problem. That's what it is. Your ego is getting in the way. If you see feedback as an opportunity and um, for betterment, quote unquote, advice, you're set up to go. You are, mm. quote unquote, coachable. The next one is um, the growth mindset. And that's what sets up. That's kind of like the, the foundation for the humility aspect of this. If you believe that your ability is fixed, which a lot of people do, I'm not good at school. I'm just not coordinated. Um, I'm not good at math. Um, she's an, you know, she's an artist. I'm not just good with, I'm not good with music. Um, I'm not a great dancer. If you're saying those things and you think they're fixed, when you, when someone gives you coaching, you're going to see it as a knock on you. You're going to mm -hmm. set yourself up for a pass fail, as opposed to, if you believe I'm not good at math yet, I'm not good at dancing yet. I'm not good at gymnastics yet. I'm not strong enough yet. When you put that word in there, it shifts the paradigm around. So I'm not good at this yet, but if you give me some feedback, um, now we can start to, that will help speed up the process. Mm -hmm. Was there a second well, piece to that question? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, how do you successfully develop coachable athletes? Oh. So my, my question there is, is, do you do that or do you just simply find those with the humility and the growth mindset and then that? No. You coach it. Yeah. You, mm. you, first is you bring awareness to it. You can actually yep. call it out. Um, you know, it, the first step in most changes is awareness. Um, but then it also has a lot to do with the way that you talk to people. Um, and we've talked about this on the podcast. It's like the way that I am so aware of this with the way I talk with my kids. Mm. Like it's so at the forefront of my mind every time I um, talk about them. And if I catch myself saying something that's going to, um, that is, um, in line with would be instilling a fixed mindset, I correct it. Mm. So it's because it's hard. If yep. you go like, like, um, like my daughter, Harley is really strong. Yep. So like, wow, Harley, you did. Wow. You're so strong. 
her identity is going to be t- tied into being strong. Yeah. Wow, Harley, you're really pretty. Like those are fixed things as opposed to like in saying strong, like, wow, Harley, you worked really hard to move that thing. Wow, you worked, you put a lot of effort into those things. Working hard and effort are malleable. They're plastic. You can change yeah. them. And that's a, that's a growth mindset. Um, and trying really hard not to reward um, results, but effort and commitment in the process. Got it. Right, so in our, in, our, in, our, in our affiliate, we talk about this with our coaches. Mm. If somebody does great on a workout, don't go, whoa, dude, you are fit. Yep. No, no, no. Whoa, dude, you crushed that workout. You worked your ass off. Awesome. And here's another one. I use it today. Uh, my favorite is we had a, I had an athlete in class today that was his first time he's ever taken a class. We were on a rower and I was working with on some rowing technique. Um, he changed, I gave him a cue or two and he changed it. And mm. my feedback, what I literally said to him, and I say this all the time early in the learning process, always, 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 I said it three times in a row to him. I was like, whoa, you are so coachable. Mm. And then at the end, and then again, it was like, um, as I walked away, I was like, love working with coachable athletes. Mm-hmm. At the end of class, I was like, dude, it's so cool to be able to work with a coachable athlete like you. Yep. Like you reinforce it. This is what yeah. we're looking for here. Yeah. Whereas if, if instead he walked in and he got on the rower and I was like, whoa, you're um, like, we, we got a lot to work on here. Or like, whoa, even the other side, you're a great rower. Like, what are you, in, what are you rewarding there? Like what you give, what you shine the light on is going to be emulated in what people look for and it's what people chase. Mm-hmm. So shine the, shine the spotlight on the coachable aspect and just call it out. Yep. Yeah, I love that. Next question. My, my wife owns a 10-year affiliate and I have a nine to five. As a side gig, she created a healthy, all-natural post-workout treat. We recently had a random person comment on the business Instagram with a negative comment about the product. This person has never tried it uh, and is commenting based on uh, the packaging. Do these negative comments need a response? If so, what is the best strategy to address this negativity? Uh, does it need a response? No. Um, um is it worth a response? Eh, maybe it depends on kind of what you're trying to set up as a business. If you are um, in total transparency and you're all about customer relations and you're all about um, everyone's a satisfied customer, then yes. If you're like, dude, we're we're gonna be get we're going into Walmart next week and we're gonna be mass produced and we're gonna be sell to Procter and Gamble next week and we we're gonna sell the company. Um, probably not. You are you're probably paying attention to the wrong things. Mm. Um, but here's the kind of the 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 even the the thing I would lean into more is when you start to. I think I learned this. It was either from you, Patrick, or from Ian. Mm. Um, when you start to get um, bad comments, yep. What that means is you've expanded your platform outside of your immediate friends and family. Yep. And that's a great thing. Yep. That's a great thing. It's actually the number one telltale sign that you are um, expanding the reaches. Yep. And um, the bigger you get, like Amazon has so many people that hate on Amazon. (laughs) So many people, right? That's amazing. But guess yeah. what? You don't hate on your mom who's trying to do this online store yep. because she's your mom. And as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, you're going to get more critics and people from the peanut gallery, people in the stands that are kind of like throwing their their critiques at you. I, um, I believe that there is no substitute for customer feedback. It is mm-hmm. the most important thing that you can get as a business owner. Having said that, Every piece of feedback doesn't necessitate a response, and every bit of feedback um, does, doesn't necessarily mean it's something that you need to take and mold and put into your product or mm-hmm. your company. Yep. What you want to do is take it, internalize it, put it through all the filters of what you're trying to create in your vision and say, does this line up? Will this move me closer to what I'm trying to create or not? So if he has a if this customer, he or she has a complaint about the packaging, take that in. Like, okay, without judgment, what could we do to improve our packaging? Mm-hmm. Does this person with it, and everything is just dropping something in a suggestion box? Um, from there, you figure it out. Maybe like, no, this is this is 
this is exactly the packaging the way we want to go um, and dot, dot, dot. But you're the director of your business, not your customers, even though the customer feedback is so important. It's Henry Ford's saying, if I had listened to my customers, I would have built them a faster horse. Mm -hmm. Mm Because no one else had the vision of what he was trying to create. That's why you're running the business and they are not. Yep. Next question. I have recently had a uh, current smokers join my CrossFit gym. I'm psyched to have them. However, I was wondering if you have ever trained clients who have been current smokers as they started CrossFit and what considerations did or would you take into account as compared to other new members? Yeah, um, I have. um, And I would talk to them about it, but I I do not come down hard on it. Mm. Um, To me, it's like they're they're doing the right thing right now. They are yeah. taking the first step. Um, you don't want to, as somebody's trying to tiptoe into the pool, you don't want to push them into the deep end yeah, totally. um, and, and scare them back away. Yep. Um, so you can create awareness around it. I know that you're, you know, that you're a smoker and it's something that we're struggling with. And if you ever want any, you know, to talk about it or anything like that, here for you. Um, but I wouldn't go uh, knee deep into it. Um, in terms of considerations with the training, it's kind of a little bit similar to training somebody with asthma. You just mm. got to be aware of it, kind of recognize the signs because they could get into coughing fits. Um, they don't have the lung capacity that a normal person would. Um, and you just got to make sure that you're not going to tip them over the edge. Got it. Got it. All right. Last question we have for today. Most affiliates have not been around for 10 plus years, so they've never had to, op- had to operate in a recession. What's your advice for operating in a down economy when people are looking to cut back on quote unquote non-essential spending? Yeah. Um, so the first thing I would do is um, tell yourself a different story. Mm. Um, 51, per- I'm, I'm making this number up, but I, be- <laughs> I shouldn't say I'm making it up. I believe this is the right number. Um, but I definitely could be wrong. I believe it's 51% of the Fortune 500 companies were started in a recession. Mm. So um, Airbnb, Uber, like some big, massive guys. It And if they go like, we're in a recession, we got to do things differently. Look for the horizon. Now, I know that there's short-term needs and things that you have to satisfy right now to stay alive. I get that. Um, but you can also shift the paradigm of um, cutting back on non-essentials. I would position myself as an essential business. Yeah. Non-essentials are getting your nails done. Mm-hmm. Non-essentials is going skiing on the weekend. Non-essentials is buying a sailboat. People's health, mental health is essential. And now more so than ever. Um, I actually believe that we are in a recession-proof business. Yeah, I just think that we're we're we are completely recession-proof. Now, if you want to talk about things that you could navigate in that, um, I certainly would not be completely fiscally irresponsible and just go, <laughs> we're going to keep spending the same, we're going to keep everything yeah. payroll the same, we're going to keep um, employment the same, we're going to keep like, um, our uh, our operational expenses the same. We're still going to do the massive addition. We're still going to renovate the bathrooms. Like what you look at is just running the business um, with the right, you know, create a, um, you know, a cash flow, mm-hmm. really simple cash flow projections with a few different scenarios and play those guys out and then tweak with some of the, uh, the flexible numbers. Yep. It's Love simple that. as that. Honestly, it's as simple as that. Like, Shift your mindset. You are essential. Shift your mindset. Recession doesn't mean that it's going to be that bad. But then also embrace the harsh realities of what's around you. Don't put your head in the clouds and go, we're okay. Just keep going. <laughs> you know, we're going to be just yeah. fine. Um, make the hard decisions um, that are needed right now to survive through this thing. Got it. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. That was another two minute drill. Thank you for sending in your great questions. Please keep them coming and we will keep answering them. Until next week, stay strong. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.